All right, got situated. All righty, so um, what we're going to talk about in this section is the notion of a function. In fact, the whole chapter is devoted to, to this notion. Um, so it's, it's actually central to the study of calculus. And so we spend a lot of time on just talking about this idea of a function and its properties uh, in chapter three. All right. So um, the notion of a function is basically a, a way of relating one set of objects to another, right? And so um, our definition, we give some, def some examples here, but our definition of a function from a set A into a set B is it's some sort of rule that takes every element in A to exactly one element in B, right? And if we denote the element in A that we're talking about by X, then F of X, F parentheses X, is how we denote uh, the, the value to which it's mapped in B. The subtlety here is that every element in A is mapped to only one element in B. So you can't send somebody in A to more than one place. That's the, that's the restriction on a function. Um, anything else you can think of is fair game, but you can only send every element in your one set to exactly one element in another. So we can actually define functions in different ways. You could have a table of values or a graph or some sort of formula, or you might just have words that describe kind of what you want to define as a function. So let's look at some examples of this. Um, so this function takes every day of the week and it, it associates with that the number of hours, let's say that you worked on that day, right? So notice that seven days in the week are over here. That's your, that's set A, let's say, the set of inputs and we're assigning to every day a unique output that gives you the number of hours that you worked, right? And so this would define a function, right? Plain and simple. Now, had I assigned to Wednesday 6.5 and 4.5, let's say, suppose I had two numbers in this column, then that would not be a function, right? You can only send everybody here to exactly one point over here. All right, so let's look at this one, right? So example two, you typically don't have, you don't rely on functions being defined verbally, right? In fact, the minute they're defined verbally like this one, the, temp, or the attempt is to then make it into some sort of formula so you could use it, right? Otherwise, it seems rather kind of useless in some sense. So for this guy here, when we say for every integer, square it and then add five, what that tells you to do is let's let x be an integer. I'm not going to write it down because I don't have the pen here, but take x to be an integer. The number that we're going to associate with that, the output, is going to be x squared, so we're going to square it, and then plus 5, right, because we're adding 5. So x squared plus 5 would be the formula for the function that would take every integer to that image. Okay. All right, so go ahead and try this. These, you wanna uh, try to associate a verbal defined function with an explicit formula. And here, what's gonna play the critical role is the order in which these operations are taking place. Um, so order of operations actually from the old chapter uh, one or zero, depending on what class you're in, um, are critical here. So try that and then we'll talk about those once you've done, once you've tried them. All right, so. For example, here, <coughs> if you were to look at this one, so for all real numbers x, multiply by three, so you first multiply by three, so you get a three x, then you square that result, you'd have three x quantity squared. That's h of x, right? If you said it was j of x, remember you have to square the entire three of x, and so you need parentheses around that. Uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, so let's compare that to the third one here. Give me an x, let's compute the square, and then multiply by three. So that means you have x squared and then times three, that would be j of x. You see the difference between the first and the third one. It's the order in which you're doing the operations. Um, for this one, if you subtract the and then square the result, well, here you're taking three from x, that's x minus three and squaring it. So you get that for part two. 
Whereas again, if you reverse the order, if you square the x and then subtract the three, then we're getting this result here. Okay, so just pay attention to the order in which things are being done so that when you're translating from words to symbols, you do so correctly. All right, so here, um, a lot of times, especially depending on what field you're in, be it biology, chemistry, economics, finance, any of those guys, um, you're gonna be deluged with graphs, right? And sometimes, most of the times they'll be functions, sometimes they won't, but most of the time they'll be functions and you want to interpret the information correctly, right? And so what we're given here is time where the T, the value of T corresponds to the month of the year. So zero is January, one is February, two is March, so on and so forth, up until 12, which would be December. And the Y axis is the number of bear sightings, apparently in some sort of remote part of uh, the United States, let's say. All right, and so what this graph tells you is just how many sightings per month on average there are. <coughs> All right, so what we're gonna focus mostly on in this, in this chapter is functions that are described by a formula, right? And so, for instance, when we have a function in this, uh, expressed in this way. So you have an output we call y, and f of x is an expression. It's an algebraic expression like any of these right here. It could be anything that you studied in chapter one or zero, depending on what class. Rational expression, polynomials, radicals, who knows what. Um, any expression involving x, all right? And what we call f of x is the functional value at x. Okay? So suppose I gave you this function here, f of x equals x squared minus 3x plus 1. And I wanted to know what number that rule maps the x equal 2 to, right? So a 2 is my input, and I want to know what value does it map to, like back here, remember, with the table, right? If I wanted the image f of Tuesday, right, I would say f of Tuesday is 8. That's the output that Tuesday is linked to. Same way here, oops, I just now have a number in and a number coming out instead of a qualitative sort of graph, uh, function. So to find f of 2, all I have to do is plug a 2 in for x everywhere I see that in the formula. So for instance, f of 2 here is 2 squared minus 3 times 2 plus 1. The minute you compute that, now you use your order of operations to simplify. Okay. Same way if we put minus 4 in for x, everywhere I see an x in this formula, I put a, a negative 4. Just be careful there with negatives because you want to make sure that you perform the operation on the entire input. So I need to put parentheses around that negative 4 to make sure that I square the minus 4. And then same way here, if you don't put parentheses around that, it's almost like you're subtracting four from minus three instead of multiplying them. So be careful and diligent with parentheses. But aside from that, it's pretty, it's pretty much that simple to compute a functional value at a x value. All right. Um, so here, let's look at a slightly more, it's, it's not harder. It's just that people get confused by it, let's put it that way. So let's look at this example. You have another quadratic function and suppose we know how to compute f of negative one, no worries with that, but f of a plus one, right? So you wanna think of that, you know, say, well, what are you talking about? I, I, I thought you only put numbers in. Well, remember algebraic expressions represent numbers the minute you assign a value to that variable. And so this is perfectly valid. I can put that in um, and compute its functional value to get an expression that involves a, right? There's nothing wrong with that but people often confuse how to do that. And so what I want you to think of until you're used to dealing with these sort of functions is rewrite the function with instead of an X, I'm gonna replace the X by a box everywhere I have it. So I have a box for the input here and I'm gonna replace the X's here by boxes. Now, to compute F of something, all that means is whatever the something you want to plug in here, be it negative one, five, or a plus one in this case, whatever's in that box, you replace by, you replace each of these boxes by the exact same thing, right? And notice that's what we did up here with f of negative one. We put a negative one in for x here and for x there, which is exactly the location of these boxes. 
So if I want f of a plus one, there's no difference in the approach. You plug in a plus one in each of those boxes. Okay? And then on the right side, once you have this, that is an algebraic expression that you can simplify using the rules of algebra. Right? We know how to square a binomial. We know how to distribute a number through a trinomial and a binomial, so on and so forth. Right? So the, the most, the newest part that causes heartburn is right here, right? Whatever's in the box clunks into the box over here. Don't be doing any sort of crazy things with this F, right? You're not multiplying these. This is an input, right? So you cannot distribute the F. Don't say this is F of A plus F of one. You cannot do any of that. This is simply a whole thing that cannot be chopped into pieces by doing anything with this function. All right. Now to see the simplification, once we have here, all I do is I foiled this part out, right? And then I distribute the minus three and the two and then added like terms, right? But this here, like I say, is the, is the part that causes the most grief. All right, so go ahead and try, look at these few functions and try to compute these functional values just at numbers, just to see what you get. And then, uh, so pause the video, do that and check yourself here momentarily. All right, so f of 0.5, I'm gonna put a 0.5 in for x, one over 0.5. Well, remember 0.5 is a half, one divided by a half is two, right? That's how I'm getting that. For this guy, g of minus six, well, g of x equals five is a constant function. What that means is that no matter what x value you give me here, be it minus six, zero, 10 million, the output's always five. Right, and so, you know, you look at this and you say, well, where do you put the X? I mean, there is no place on the right side to put it. But that simply means the output is five, right? The, the value of X doesn't change the output. And so you just get five in this case. Uh, for this guy here, H of zero, plug a zero in for X. That's what I do here. Simplify to get minus three. And then finally, J of minus two, I'm plugging a minus two in for X. Do not forget to square the minus two, right? If I square minus two, this becomes one over positive four. One fourth is 0.25. So in the end, you get 1.75. <laughs> All right. Um, so in terms of notation errors, I already talked about one of these above. You cannot distribute the application of a function across a sum. So for instance, when what I was talking about the f of a plus one business, you cannot say it's f of a plus f of one. Let's don't even do that. This is not multiplication. This is f of some object, right? So you can't do that. Don't treat it like a variable. Um, same way here. Um, basically, this is the same idea. You cannot distribute f through a quotient or a product, right? So it's just a single object. And likewise, if I'm dividing two functional values, you can't just cancel the f's, right? Again, these are not being multiplied like they were in when we talk about rational expressions. These are functional values. They're outputs that are associated with these inputs A and B. And so you can't just cancel them. Okay? Um, on your own here, I don't have extra examples. I provided them in the example. But you want to actually create your own examples just to cement these ideas in, that these quantities just don't hold. All right, let's try. Oh, okay, so let's look at example five. So I can show, eventually we will actually graph this sort of thing, but you can prove that this is a function. If you give me a single X, there is a single output, right? So that um, can be done, don't worry about that. Um, but if I wanted to compute some functional values, we know we're kind of pros at this now, we can plug in one for X, we can plug in two for X, but what if I told you to plug in negative one for X? Right? If I try plugging in negative one, I get negative one here, which is fine, but then I have two over zero. Right? And we know what we can't do is divide by zero. And so apparently negative one, if you plug it in, you get some undefined expression. What that tells you is there's no output for negative one. Right? And that's gonna happen, right? So not every time will a function be defined for every real number. And so what we want to do is gather together all of the value, all the real values that, um, for which the function does have a sensible output. And that set is called the domain. 
All right, so what I want to do is, given various expressions for f of x, I want to first determine what the natural domain is, the biggest subset of the real numbers for which there are sensible outputs, just so that I don't have to worry about can I compute this or not, or I already have in front of me which, which values I can actually compute the functional value of. All right. And then for all those, if I gather together all of the outputs in a set, we call that the range. All right. So let's look at example six, right? You, the only number that causes grief on the right side is the one that makes the bottom zero. And so negative one does not belong to, to the domain, but every other number you give me provides a sensible expression, right? And so the domain here, the natural domain, is every real number except for minus one. And so if you think about what that looks like on a number line, you have a full number line, and then you'd have at negative one, you'd have a open hole. Right? And so if you want to write this using interval notation, start at negative one and go to the left, that gives you this guy. Start at negative one and go to the right, that gives you that guy, and then union them together. Right? That set is the domain. All right, so um, next for uh, another function, what if I consider square roots? Right? Now, when we talked about radicals before, we notice that if you happen to have a negative radicand and you're taking a square root or a fourth root or any even index root, you're gonna get an i. And what we're not gonna allow to have happen now is there to be an output that involves i, right? We wanna look at real valued functions, which means they take real numbers to real numbers, right? Because, because we, want, we wanna be able to graph them. And when there are i's involved, the graph just doesn't behave the same way. Right, and so we're not going to allow imaginary outputs. That said, the only way you're going to get an imaginary output for a square root is if you take the square root of a negative number. Right, so to avoid that, I'm going to insist on the radicand, 3x plus 2, being non-negative. It could be 0, right? If it's 0, the square root of 0 is itself 0, right? So that's perfectly well uh, acceptable. And it could be positive, right? So I had to solve this linear inequality, to subtract the two and divide by three, to get what x values I could plug in here to ensure that I get a sensible real output. Right, so in this case, everything to the right of and including minus two thirds is in the domain. And so I have this right ray that's closed on the left side as the domain. All right, let's go ahead and try, go ahead and try these. Right, so three functions, you have rational expressions and radicals all tossed in. See what you get, right? So pause the video, try to do these and see what all you get and we'll talk about them when you come back to the, to the video. All right, so let's look at the first one. It's purely rational expression, polynomial over polynomial. And so the only time rational expressions are not defined is when the bottom is zero. The bottom's already factored, and so we know that a product of real numbers is zero only if one of those numbers happens to be zero, right? So x could be zero, x plus five could be zero, or x squared plus one could be zero, right? And if any of those is zero, then we're dividing by zero, that's no good. All right, so, well, if x is zero, then we have to throw zero out. The number that makes x plus five zero is negative five, so we'll need to throw that out from the domain. And here, x squared plus one is always non, it's always positive. In fact, it's always bigger than or equal to one, no matter what real number x you put in there. And so it's never zero, right? That never, that's not gonna give you any point to remove from the domain. And so the only values we're throwing out are zero and minus five. And so the intervals that I get, if you think of a number line, you'd have a number line with two holes, one at minus five, one at zero, and so the intervals in between are all part of the domain. All right. For the second one, this is basically just like example seven that we talked about, right? You need, it's a square root, so in order for this to produce a real number, the inside has to be bigger than or equal to zero. If you solve that for x, add seven divided by four, you get, get this right-hand ray. 
keep in mind, had this been a cube root, you can take the cube root of negative numbers, right? Because if you cube a negative number, you get a negative number back. So just be careful. Cube roots, the domain here would be all real numbers, right? If I had the fourth root, same story. The inside has to be non-negative. So it's just, it's just a distinction between even and odd index uh, radicals here. Uh, and j of x is very similar to h, but now I'm dividing by this radical instead of just having it in a numerator. So we have an additional restriction, namely that the radical itself cannot be zero, right? Not only does the radicand have to be non-negative, I cannot put the x value in there that makes it zero because the square root of zero is zero and I can't divide by zero, right? So here, the only extra restriction over part two is I have to now throw out seven fourths. And so now I get this open right-hand ray. All right, so let's take a look at this. Now, what if we start throwing them together? Right, you can form functions by plugging anything in for, rash, for these uh, algebraic expressions. So what if I have both of these radicals and uh, parts in the bottom? Right? Well, you handle one restriction at a time. There's, I mean, there's no difference in the approach. You just have to get more restrictions is all. No big deal. So look at the bottom. The bottom cannot be zero. And so I have to throw out both zero and negative five, just like I did here. Furthermore, in order to produce a real number, I need the radicand here to be non-negative. So I need one minus x to be non-negative, right? So I need this condition too. But if I solve that for x, add the x to both sides, you'd get one bigger than or equal to x. But remember, you read inequalities from the variable. And so one bigger than or equal to x corresponds to x less than or equal to one. Okay, so if you were to graph all of this on a single number line like I did here, you would start at one and shade to the left. That would be a left ray that corresponds to this piece. But then, you also put open holes at zero and at negative five like I did, right? Because I can't allow those values in, I'd be dividing by zero. And so an in interval notation then, I have this guy here, which is this piece. I have the piece between minus five and zero. That's this open interval. And then I have the half open interval from zero to one. And I'm simply unioning those together. All right. Your turn here. Same idea. Let me just talk you through briefly and I'll let you check it on your own later. Um, you can't have, the bottom can't be zero, right? So I have to throw out x equals two and whatever makes that guy equal to zero. And don't forget you have to, since this is a even root, you need the inside to be non-negative, but it can't be zero, right? So you're gonna solve the inequality two x plus one Oops, strictly positive, right? And so we know that x has to be bigger than negative one half and x cannot be two, right? So you have those two conditions that have to hold. Notice I didn't do anything with the x plus one, right? That's in the numerator of the fraction. It doesn't itself have a square root around it. So there's no value of x that makes the numerator undefined, right? You can have a zero up there zero over a number that's not zero is equal to zero, right? So in other words, zero over five is equal to zero, that's defined. Um, and there's no reason it can't be negative because I'm not taking the root of that. And so I only have the two restrictions, x not two and x bigger than negative one half. You always wanna to try to draw those on a number line. And so you have the open interval from minus one half to two, and then from two to infinity union to up. And then example nine, I'll let you read on your own. Um, it's just a matter of computing um, with functions and interpreting in context. So it's kind of getting you geared up for what you consider to be word problems, but now using functions to, to model them. Right, so I'll let you read that one on your own. And then your turn six, um, let's actually talk about your turn six. All right, so. The cost C of X of manufacturing X hard drive is defined to be that guy, 55 plus 10x, and it's assumed that the units are in dollars, all right? 
We know how to compute C of four. You simply plug in four for X, right? So that's what I do here. And now well, what does that number tell you? I mean, it's a number 95, so what? Well, remember what C of X represents. It's the cost of, of manufacturing X hard drives. And so here, since X is four, this $95 is the cost of manufacturing four hard drives. Okay, that's, that's the interpretation of that function. All right, units are very important, right? So that's true no matter what field you're in. We don't wanna do this in a vacuum. Although sometimes just with computations, like an algebra, just to get you used to the rules, we'll have the, you know, we'll just have you do this stuff outside the context of a real world problem, just to get you adept at working with these expressions. But the minute you're in a real world problem, you have to account for units. It'll help you interpret what the meaning is. All right, and so part two here, what is meant in this context by a solution of this equation? Well, remember, C of X represents the cost of manufacturing X hard drives. If that cost is equal to $455, what a solution would be is the number of hard drives X that you could manufacture so the cost would be $455. Okay. Think about that. All right. All right, so once you're done with the video and you feel good, go ahead and try the problems. Again, remember these are in the PDF of chapter three, section one, if you're in pre-calc other section, or if you're in uh, 115 or 113. If you're in uh, pre-calc, it's in chapter one. Um, so go ahead, try these problems and let me know if you have any issues. All right, take it easy, bye.